Hello and welcome to another edition of Harona and I am Harona Drame. Today my guest is Dr. Jay Sise. Jay, welcome to Harona. Thank you Harona for having me and uh, I'm pleased to be here. It's a pleasure to finally get to sit down and have this conversation. Absolutely. I think during COVID we did one online. But yes. It's never really the same like when you do it in person. Yeah, you're right. Um, that was a weird conversation, but it was still good. It was. So, yeah. It was, absolutely. So, with Harona, it's very typical that we begin with childhood. You, uh, village, Fana Fana, town, Fajara, <laughs> Banjul, where? <laughs> My childhood, it's... Uh, so, I grew up in Buyam, mm -hmm. surprisingly, which is not the Fana Fana village, but in Buyam, if you know Buyam very well, you have so many seases in Buyam. So I'm from the family of the late Ali Sise, Alaji Ali Sise, who was the Imam of Buyam for a long time. That's my mom's dad. So that's where I grew up in. Whilst um, I think I was there till I was about maybe 10 or 11, because my dad and my mom were in Sierra Leone, Freetown. They were diamond business people. So I stayed with my grandparents for a while. How long you been there? Do you get to speak a little bit of Jola? Because Boyam, it's uh, predominantly Jola, isn't it? Yes, so I'm an international, well, they call me United Nations for a reason, because whilst I was in Boyam, I think I was able to understand a lot of Jola. Uh, I spoke a lot of Mandinka back then, to the point where when I came to my Fana Fana people, they were like, that's the Sosa girl. Mm. So, and uh, my grandmom is fuller. So, Buyam had a lot of different cultures. You have Jolas, you have Fulas, you have Manjagos. Everyone used to come to her shop. And I was helping her from an early, early age, probably about the age of five, when I used to help her at her store. What are your memories of Buyam those days? I mean, thinking that there were no iPads, no phones, no internet. <laughs> I mean, not to say, I mean, you've been here for a minute, but you know what I mean. Yes. What were the games that you enjoyed then? So growing up, uh, if I may remember, we were not, my grandparents were very structured in terms of Islam. So we used to not do a lot of playing around, but just for free times, like in between Dara and school, we would do Padinyadi. And um, I remember we had these little dolls that I used to make and then we'd play with them. But most of my, childhood was hanging around my grandmom for sure and talking to her no like, narcos well my my grandparents did a lot of famine so i used to get up early in the morning when there was no school and go to the farm with her and we'll go get my grandpa had a geta a huge one so we'll go get the milk mm -hmm. bring it back home and then eat breakfast and head on to school but sometimes will go to the farm and stay there and farm. So I knew a lot of farming mechanisms. So. All right, from Buyam, you started school there, I'm assuming. So yes. there was no nursery schools in Buyam, I'm, no, I'm assuming. No, we didn't do any nursery school. So my grandpa was not into the, the, the conventional the, school, conventional education. So it was more Dara. So I had Dara. I did Dara where you had the, the in the afternoon, we'll go fetch firewood, and at night after seven, we'll read the Quran. Light out the fire. Yes, we'll read yeah. the Quran till about midnight, from midnight, then we'll go and study our books because we were in school too as well. So we didn't do nursery school, it was all Dara. Even my mom did not go to conventional school, she did Dara. So. Yeah, it was a lot of data in back those days, and it's, it's beneficial. So how did that Mandinka girl fit when you came down to the combos? Well, it fit very well, because whilst I was in Buyam, the headmaster that was in uh, Lamin, St. Peter's Primary School, his name was Mr. John Bojang, mm -hmm. and he... Uh, John P. Bojang. John P. Bojang, mm -hmm. yes. He was like a son to my grandpa, 
because my grandpa was well known in Fonyi. And whilst he was in school in Fonyi, he said my grandpa introduced meat to him and gave them a lot of food and helped them a lot. So when we moved over, when my parents, my mom came first, mm -hmm. so my mom brought me back to the Combos to go back, to go to school from here. Then he insisted that my brother and I go to Lamin, St. Peter's Primary. So we used to uh, travel from here all the way to St. Peter's Primary. What is, where is here? Uh, we were in uh, Bundung Mamutfana at first, mm -hmm. and then we spent maybe about six months, and we moved to Latikunda Jaman, where we are still residing, and we used to travel from there all the way to St. Peter's. But we had uh, drivers that would take us, so it wasn't as difficult. So making up choices as to what you want to be, how you want to be, and uh, when you grow up, I mean, there were dreams, weren't they? Yes, uh, growing up, I was given choices multiple occasions with my grandparents. What they instilled in me was not necessary to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever. It was making sure I knew that I have a full potential to be what I wanted to be, regardless of where I was. And uh, their priorities was my character as a person, as a good citizen. So growing up, I did not really think about going into medicine or anything like that because I'm the type of person if you tell me to do one thing I will do the opposite so so my dad was more interested in me because I'm the firstborn was more interested in me going to business because mm. he had Nyamina Enterprise and it was a huge business and he wanted me to uh, take over after high school he did not really want me to travel abroad but and I actually did accounting in high school too uh, but I was not really interested in in staying and doing business but I still volunteered and learned some things whilst I was here but high school which one St. St. Joseph's High School. Okay, you went to the proper high school. That's good. That's good as Saints. <laughs> it's not the other one. Yeah, St. Joseph's High School. It's not Gambia High. I, mean, I didn't name names, <laughs> but you're getting there. But uh, those days as well, making up your mind, you were a command student, I assume. Mm -hmm. So who were the people you remembered in high school and with whom you're still friends? So I remember several people that I'm still in contact with. I remember Fatusane from DRTS. Yes. We used to, so I did not have like a group of people that I was with. I had a group of friends based on task. That's how my mind worked. So Fatu and Kine, they were more into studying Kine? hard. Kine Njai, yes. she's now in London. Mm. They, they were the people that were more into studying, so I was always hanging out. That's with the study them. group. That's the study group. So, yeah. And I had uh, some that were close to my house. One of them is Ida Sise, yeah, Ida. And her mom was really fun of me and wanted me to be around her kids as well. So I used to hang out. Unfortunately, she passed away, so may her soul rest in peace. She passed right before we graduated from high school. But those are people that I stayed connected with. Um, Kinenjai and Sophie Njai, who I still communicate with. Yeah, Aida, I met them a few days ago, and Fatu Gillen, and a few of the classmates. So I was um, not the type that was always going out like one of my sisters, mm -hmm. but I, I had some friends that I still keep in touch uh, with. I still have some friends that I still keep in touch with. This is Harona with Dr. Jay Cisse. We'll be back after this very short commercial break. Enjoy 1,000 minutes of talk time from your Africa line to your loved one or your favorite person for $150. Dial star 135 hash to get your very own 1,000 minutes of talk time. Let's talk. Welcome back to Harona with my guest, Dr. Jay Cisse. So, Gambia High School wasn't part of the plan. We were Augustinians from St. Joseph's and all of that. And having done accounting, how did you do the switch? So when I was in the commerce class, I was not into accounting as much, except for the accounting part, but not all the other subjects. I took, I love math. So most of my classes were all in the math area, like statistics, ad maths, all the difficult math classes. I took those in uh, biology, 
one of them, I think I took one biology class because I was still trying to figure out what did I really want to do. Um, so I was not, because my dad wanted me to be in business and I am still trying to figure myself out because mm -hmm. I knew that was not my passion. Mm -hmm. So I just did a lot of different subjects. And then when I moved, um, after I graduated high school, I, I, my dad was not here. He was in um, um, Angola because he's a diamond man. So he had traveled to Angola. So I, I got my own visa, my own passport, my own visa without my dad or my mom knowing. Mm -hmm. And I later on told them that I have a visa to go to the US. I had my own I-20. I was always able to do things on my own without, I'm very independent. So I was able to travel to the US. After that. And then what? The and girl from Buyam, <laughs> I mean, from uh, uh, Latikunda, now in the U.S. Yes. Then so, what? So even in the U.S., I, I, I had one guy um, who was a friend of my cousin who was going to school in uh, a small little town called Corsicana, Navarro College. Mm -hmm. And I contacted the guy uh, through my uh, cousin, of course. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, that's how I ended up in Corsicana. Corsicana was one of the smallest little uh, mm -hmm. community, would, colleges? community colleges. N not the college itself, but the, the, the area okay. is very small. But the college was a two-year college, but it was very well interna known internationally. We had a lot of international students. And back then, there were a few Gambians that were already there. So that's where I found myself in that small little uh, community college that became home. Mm -hmm. And I, I really adored that place. Was there the place that you decided to do the switch, or you were still finding yourself in college? So when I when I got to Corsicana, uh, on my way to to the to the to the dorms and the school, when they picked me up from Dallas, uh, it's like maybe an hour and a half or two hours uh, driving there. I saw a store called Payless, and I was like, mm. "This is where I'm going to work." And they were all laughing. They said, "Work here? These people don't hire black people." I said, "I'm not black." They say, what are you? I say, I'm brown. <laughs> yeah. so, so that's where I started working. And then when I went in, I also went to a nursing home. And you were supposed to get a certification. So trying to get the certification for the nursing home, for the nursing, uh, nurses' aid license, mm -hmm. uh, I had to attend some classes. And some of those students were not, uh, they were international students, and English was not their first language or official language. There were a lot of Ethiopians. And one of the instructors I remembered, we did a test, like the practical test. Um, mm -hmm. The theory, I had 100, because it was one of the easiest tests ever. And then the practical, he looked, she looked at me and thought I was not suitable for the job. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I couldn't do well. And he, she failed me. Mm -hmm. And that was a blessing. When she failed me and I looked at her and I said, Psst, you're right, this is too cheap for me. I should be better than that. Mm -hmm. That's how I interpreted that decision that she made, that she failed me. I was the only one that failed in the class, but I was the only one that had 100, 100 in the class. In the so I said, well, God wanted me to do something else. And that's when my passion started and I started looking into nursing and healthcare and having developed more interest in sciences and stuff. So. And that was it. The rest is history, like they would say. Amen. <laughs> so when we bring present day, I mean, from that little college, what was next? Where did you go? Did you move out of state? Did you stay within Texas? What was it? And the driving force is perhaps having failed. It's always an impetus to want to oh, do yeah. better and to uh, be more. Yeah. Now, but then what informs the next steps that you would have taken to become D, Dr. J. Well, so in Corsicana, it's a two-year college. So I did my um, associate in science, and it was one of the most beautiful experiences over there. I used to hang out with the Christian Fellowship, where I end up becoming the homecoming queen mm -hmm. in that uh, small town. So I was very well known. So after I graduated, one of the science, he was a chemistry teacher. He couldn't believe that I did not do chemistry in high school. So he introduced me to a few colleges that I could transfer to in the Dallas area. So I applied for several different colleges. I applied for one of the universities, and then I also applied for a nursing program. Well, and 
actually before I left Corsica, they also had a nursing program, an associate degree. And I was with a friend, uh, a Dean family, Nafi. So we took a test. You're supposed to take a uh, like a precaution test to see if they would be accepted because it's like hundreds of students that are applying for these positions. So I got accepted to the RN program, and she got accepted to the LVN program. But then the RN program was a waiting list for her, <laughs> and I was like, "That's okay. If I drop, so I found out that she was next in line. If I dropped." She would have had it. She would have it. So I ended up dropping the RN program and went on to Dallas because I had several different colleges. So I said to myself, I have an opportunity to go to different colleges, and this is one chance that she may have. So I ended up dropping, and she took over that spot. So I moved to Dallas and went to a Brookhaven College and did my associate in nursing there, the program itself, because you do like a two-year associate degree in science and then another two-year in a nursing program. So I did my nursing there. Right before I graduated the program, I had several, like the VA hospital, Parkland, which is where they took care of J.F. Kennedy when he mm -hmm. was shot, and uh, Methodist Hospital. So I went to different uh, colleges, and pre like when you do your clinicals, I went to different uh, locations and hospitals, and I graduated with my associate in nursing. And uh, because I did not want to pay, because I had to pay for my education, Mm -hmm. And I did not want student loans. Mm -hmm. So I had a choice to either go for a four-year college or go for a two-year college. I said to myself... At but the you would have done a two-year college twice. Yes, but it's, it's a different degree. See, mm -hmm. I still have two associate degrees in science and nursing, but I would have still just gotten a bachelor's degree in nursing, mm -hmm. but the fees that I would have been paying would be maybe three times more for the same, and when I'm done with the education, I'm going to have the same salary. So I'm a fan of fan. Every time I have to calculate what is the benefit. Yeah, it's just a paper, but here I'm going to make money and I can use that to pay for my education to continue. So I chose the two-year college to get my associate. And then the hospital that I got hired paid for my uh, continuation to get my bachelor's and went on. And whilst I was there, I had a lot of went opportunities. Went on. Yep. Went, went on, on to become who I am now. <laughs> uh, who are you now? I'm Dr. J um, in family medicine. I have uh, family practices in uh, Dallas area, and I have a pediatrics practice as well, a wellness clinic, and a family practice office that sees um, two, years, two, two weeks old till 100 or 100 and whoever knows. So. Okay, 100 and whoever knows, we'll take a second break here. When we come back, the final words with Dr. J. This is Harona, and I'm Harona Drame. Thank you. What keeps us connected? Is it the memories we share? Is it the pictures we take every single morning? Is it the bond that binds us? Is it the time we spend together? Is it sharing the same dream or the same life? The secret is this deep connection between us. Keep it real. Stay connected. Welcome back to Harona with my guest, Dr. J. Cisse. Dr. J. D. Dr. J. So, we come to current day. I mean, I know medicine is always challenging. And it's not, it's not so much of a fana fana kind of profession. <laughs> really. I mean, you were driven. I mean, the enterprise, the background, the environment, the inspiration is all geared towards business. The Boutouts and the Dallases, right? So, making that shift can't be easy. And having made it also, you know, wanting to go into practice for yourself, you're still bringing that business and profession to marry, right? Absolutely. So how did that happen? So for me, um, once I got into the health sector, once I was in the hospital, I realized my potential that there is more that I can do, and there is more that I can learn. And whilst I was there, I seized the opportunity to uh, 
be in management, uh, start projects, programs. I was able to start several programs like outpatient clinics for the hospital. Um, I did oncology. So most of the doctors that I worked with from orthopedic to oncology to all the sectors, general surgery, they were always pushing me because they saw what I could do and they actually trusted me with some of their patients and I will make decisions even prior to them arriving at the hospital. So that motivated me more to go into medicine. But going into medicine, I loved taking care of people. I love giving service to people. That's my passion. That's what makes me happy. That's, that's something that I cannot even express sometimes because the joy it gives me is more, more than anything else. Bigger than the joy of money in the bank account. Absolutely. absolutely. I, I thought you would be driven more about money, no? The money that I'm driven about money so I can give back, not for me. Oh, so you're just a conduit, right? Just money comes yes. through and then... and that's how I believe it should be. Okay. Because you can only eat so, so much. So looking forward to a check, right? Absolutely, no worries. Just okay. pray that I get more. The more I get, the more you get too. <laughs> okay. So, so for me, money is a, it's, it's good because that's how you can help people. If you're broke, obviously you can't help anyone. If you're in medicine and you're broke as well, you may be looking at different things that could prevent you from giving the services, the quality service that you should give. So whilst working in the hospitals, the patients whilst I was in the hospitals, they're the ones that pushed me to go into outpatient. So in the hospital, the doctors pushed me to become one of them. In the hospital, the patients pushed me to become outpatient clinics. So within one day uh, that I was in the ho hospital setting, like in the emergency room, because I did emergency medicine as well, several patients will be like, can we just get your number so you, ca you can help us out when we're not here? And I would volunteer my services to people outside of the U.S., in the Gambia, in Senegal, pretty much everywhere. So that motivated me to go into practice, private practice. And I also am very independent. I want to make a difference where I can see the impact on people and society. And knowing that even though healthcare is good in the U.S., there's still underserved, underprivileged people that need my help. And that really pushed me to move forward into getting my practice started and uh, that was just God's doing it was not very difficult I would give it give the glory back to God because I did my part but he also allowed me to become what I wanted it to be what's next so next um, I'm still going to continue to grow uh, the day that you start grow growing, laterally grow uh like a pyramid grow so huh. so 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 when you grow as a person uh, i think growth would be more striving for your full potential which is never ending until the day you die so i'll continue to educate myself in different sectors learn about business learn about development self development because uh, i did not even stop as a provider because i see that while providing services to patients there is a lot of issues in terms of mental health in terms of people that are wanting to reach their full potential but they may have a little bit of a uh, constraint that's keeping them from moving forward so i ended up joining a team with john maxwell which is a coaching international coaching leadership development and personal personal development so i took classes i'm certified now in that so so I'm always trying to seek knowledge and see things that I can do to improve me and people around me. Gambia. Where is Gambia in that big plan of growth, of becoming more, achieving full potential? Where is Gambia fitting? Well, I wouldn't be who I am today without the Gambia. Oh, we know that. We so, mean the potential. Now. So, so, so because of that, I have to give back to the Gambia and to Africa in general, because I see the strength that Africans have, even in the US, in, in the diaspora, that Africans will need, Africa will need Africans to go. Otherwise, Africa would go without Africans. Africa would go without Africans. So as Africans, we have to come back and give back to Africa. And uh, it, it wouldn't be any 
better to start from your origin. So that's why I'm back here to see what can I do to help the people that helped me become who I am today. So uh, I, I don't know where that's going to head to because only God knows. But as of today, I know every individual that I come in contact to, the least I can do is at least render a smile to them because that may be something that will go a long way for that person. You haven't said much. Actually, you've said much, but you haven't said anything. I haven't said anything. Because I was expecting you were going to say, okay, medicine is my profession. Healthcare is where I am at. And I could potentially think of what I could do with Edward Francis Small Teaching Hospital. Or maybe I'll even go and set up my own private clinic. Or maybe I'll do a collaboration. Maybe I will... Maybe, 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 maybe. I just gave you a broad description. Of because, a smile, really. Yes, I just gave <laughs> you a broad description of what I'm wanting to do, meaning my doors are open for anything that needs development in this country. Because when I came in, uh, just looking at the health sector, the health sector, for me, it's, it's, it's the concept of just giving health care to an individual. It doesn't stop there. I believe in the mind, body, and soul. So you cannot treat someone when their environment is not conducive to wellness. You cannot prescribe a medication to someone and expect them to be compliant when they have multiple issues in terms of mental health, which is affected by their social well-being, their surrounding, that is not conducive to that person receiving the information you're given. So that's why for me at this point, Point, it's very difficult to even see where do I start. Uh, but I know for one thing that I've started few things, like I was able to go to the prison system because even though someone has committed the crime, that does not stop them from being human. Okay, because that's what God, God wants us to do. We should just respect those people for the sake of Allah. And at the same time, uh, I've also visited a few clinics like the health center, Fajikunda and Serakunda. I'm trying to come up with a project to see how can I impact the society in terms of maternal health, because we have a lot of uh, women that are dying from uh, deliveries and stuff like that. So anything that I can do in that sector, starting out with small projects and then seeing where that can lead to. Now you're talking. But the girls in STEM, women in STEM, or in the sciences in general, I mean, I would want you to give a minute where you're speaking to young girls, young women, ladies, perhaps even your age mates who are considering going into the sciences or perhaps uh, making a difference in the overall well-being of everybody around them. And you have a minute to address such a group of people. What would you say? I would say the same thing that I said to my sister, who is an OBGYN doctor moms. I'm going to say hi to all my sisters that are watching as well. The, the sister show is where I'm usually with. Um, what I said to her when she came to the U.S., she went to university here and she did sciences and she knew she wanted to do medicine. But then people were telling her how difficult it was that she shouldn't do medicine. She should probably do um, uh, computer science or probably go into um, nursing. And I told her, you know, it's not about what people think you should do. And it's not about what you think you want to do, but it's about who you want to be later on. What do you want to do in life? Regardless of what it is, whether it's the sciences. Yes, sciences are great, but not everyone was molded to be in that sector. Not everyone is supposed to sit at a table and calculate money like my dad did. So as a person, what you should do is what makes you serve your purpose in life. And that purpose has to be seek by the individual themselves from finding out who they are as a person. And then from there, they can understand what they want to be when they grow up. And we are going to still continue to grow up. Growing up mean, it doesn't mean that you are going to stop at that stage. It means that until you get to your full potential, which is never ending, you should continue to seek 
to seek knowledge. Um, a lot of kids around here now, especially women, uh, are not looking into education. But regardless of what you want to be later on, the education is a stepping stone and it's the key to help you be critically analyze situation and critically think. For our society and Africa in general to move forward, education has to be a priority, especially for women, because I remember uh, going to the U.S., one of my, the statements from my dad was that so jehale high school santiala. Right? Um, usually after grade six, you get, you get married. And that's talked with me when I know I have six or seven other uh, sisters. We have more girls in the family than boys. And I said to myself, if I accept this norm, then that means I'm it not only accepting it for me, but I'm also accepting for it for the rest of my siblings. So I'm going to t do whatever it takes to make sure the burden does not only lie on me and my sisters, but it will be just on me. So I will have to pave the way and create the avenue for them to be able to become what they want to be. If they don't want to go to school, at least it should be their choice. But they should have other means where they can be independent for themselves, they can think for themselves, they can critically analyze situations, because all the craziness that's going on in Africa is not anything but lack of knowledge within our communities and it starts with a woman because when my dad said that I went back because he educated me in the Quran and I went back I said well if you look at Suratul Maryam it's God is blessing the woman and the woman is supposed to be the educator how do you expect me to educate people when I'm not, not educated, educated myself. myself so I think we should empower women to be educated and all the girls out there you can be what you can be or what you want to be. So go for your full potential. Do not agree to a man telling you settle for to have kids or settle to be married. Some people may choose that and that's okay. But we should at least have our independence to be able to choose what we want to choose. Dr. J, it's a pleasure talking to you. Same here. Thank you. <laughs>